Hey everybody! In our last video, we said that materials informatics has the potential to introduce a paradigm shift, a completely new way of thinking about how materials get discovered. So, in order to explain that fully, we ought to take a step back and describe to you the crazy ways in which we end up with materials and how they're discovered today. And it's amazing because we sort of take it for granted. We head down to Home Depot or Lowe's to pick up, you know, PVC or metal or galvanized or whatever, and we never stop to think about how did this get invented in the first place? So let me show you a few examples by which materials have come to be invented in the past. So let's start with the first one. I'm going to call this that some discoveries are 1% inspiration, 99% percent perspiration approach right now many of you are probably aware of who this person is here in this figure this is thomas edison right now thomas edison uh, amazing figure invented a ton of things our modern life is has his fingerprints all over it as a friend of mine says um now you might have heard that he invented the light bulb and he didn't actually invent the light bulb it had been invented previously but there was a problem nobody had a good filament material this filament material that actually lights up there were no good options because they would all go out after a while after a very short period of time you need something that would last longer if you're going to actually you know make this a, a product that people could use so the year is 1879 they're only burning for a few hours and Thomas Edison's working on this and it says he was sitting in his lab one day it says uh, Edison was sitting in his laboratory absent-mindedly rolling a piece of compressed carbon between his fingers and then he got to thinking like well what if we took different carbonized you know thread like materials what maybe they would work um, and so he began carbonizing every sort of material that he could get his hands on. It was wild. Uh, he was thinking plants would be the first good option because they sort of form fibrous, you know, things. And so he's looking at different plants. He tries baywood and boxwood and cedar and flax and bamboo, on and on and on. He starts contacting scientists on far-flung regions of the world in the tropics and elsewhere, sending him samples, and he's trying all these things. Um, this approach, to this day, we call Edisonian trial and error, just trying lots of things until something works, right? Uh, Edison himself acknowledged that this was tedious. Uh, in fact, here's a quote from him. He says, before I got through, he recalled, I tested no fewer than 6,000 different vegetable growths, and I ransacked the world for the most suitable filament material. Um, and then hear this part because i think of me as a graduate student you know if i had three or four or five experiments in a row all fail man it was pretty easy to feel pretty bummed and pretty down on yourself and here's someone who had six thousand in a row fail how do you keep your spirits up to keep trying right so here's what he said the electric light has caused me the greatest amount of study and has required the most elaborate experiments he wrote i was never myself discouraged or inclined to be of hopeless success uh, of success but i cannot say the same of all of my colleagues he also went on to say, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So, you know, I don't think that your average Joe that this would work for them. To be able to keep on trying in the face of 5,999 failures to that 6,000th plan or whatever it was and have that, uh, you know, drive to keep working, it's going to be pretty tough. But that is one approach. And honestly, this is a way that many, many materials are discovered. We take what's been out there and we just keep on trying new things, slight variations until we get something that is better for what we want. Um, that's one approach. Now, there are other approaches. You might say that materials discovery is based on being in the right place at the right time. And that was certainly the case with the discovery of Teflon. And Teflon is this amazing material. Look, right here in front of me in my workshop, I've got some Teflon tape. We use it all around us. Now, this was discovered in 1938. We are at DuPont Chemical, and the scientist was Roy J. Plunkett. He and his assistant, Jack Reebok, we, they were doing some research on floor polymers, on, well, on fluorinated molecules, and they were actually not polymers yet. These were gases. They were working with tetrafluoroethylene gas, right? So this is not the Teflon that we now know it today because it hasn't been polymerized yet, but they didn't know that it could be. They were working with this gas, then they went home for the night, and they came back the next morning. They go to turn their gas cylinder on, and no gas comes out. But they feel the, heavy, the weight of this thing, and they're like, oh, this is still heavy, like there's gas in there. What's happening with it? So they do something dangerous. They, do, <laughs> they take the valve off, even though it's pressurized, um, and nothing happens, right? There's no gas that comes bursting out. Instead, instead, they turn this thing upside down, and out comes some white particles, right? Some white powder, and they're thinking, well, that's odd. What, what, what on earth would this be? And they do something even crazier. They take a hacksaw, and they cut right into the half of this cylinder, which is crazy to be cutting into a pressurized cylinder. I guess they knew that there was no pressure because they'd taken the valve off. In any case, as they cut through it, they see this white powder building up on the inside of the vessel. You can see it in this photo here, this big, thick layer of white powder on the bottoms and sides of the vessel. 
and they had discovered Teflon. Totally just being in the right place at the right time. Totally a matter of being curious about the world around you. When something seems out of place and doesn't make sense, don't just say, weird, <laughs> and get rid of the cylinder. Investigate it a little bit. Um, hopefully you find ways to do so safely. But yeah, this is about being in the right place at the right time. And voila, we have Teflon, an incredibly important engineering material used in oodles of applications today. Um, all right, let's keep on going. You might say that inspiration for materials discovery could be taken from nature, and that would certainly be the case. In fact, Velcro, which we know and love, also all around me here in my lab, um, was invented by a guy named George de Maestro in 1940. He was hunting in the Jura Mountains in Switzerland, and he, he's you know an engineer, and yet he's hunting, and he notices that his hunting dog is getting all these burrs stuck in his fur, right? The cockle burrs that were getting stuck in his pants and on the dog's fur uh, were, you know, have this sort of shape, and he realized, you know, that hook and loop shape could be really useful. What if we design materials based off of that, you know, shape from nature? And voila, we have Velcro. How about this one? You could say that materials discovery requires a keen eye for detail, right? This goes back to 1913 with Harry Brearley of Sheffield, uh, England, who was trying to do, uh, he was not trying to discover a rustless steel, right? But the discovery of stainless steel is tied to his searching for a better gun barrel, right? So they were shooting, uh, they were making guns and they were realizing that not all steels perform as well. Some crack and break. And so he was trying to reduce the damage that was being done to the barrels when they were firing them. And as a metallurgist, he was trying out a bunch of different steel alloys. And every time we'd try something and it didn't work, he'd put it in the waste bin, right? And over time, he'd try other ones. And obviously, we know about steels, especially since stainless steel hadn't been invented yet, that you know, in a workshop, probably getting wet, things are going to be rusting. And so that waste bin is full of rusty, old, corroded metal, right? Well, as he's working in different metals, one day he looks in his waste bin, and something's still shining, even though it's been weeks or months or whatever the period of time is later. And it should not be shining because it should be corroded, like everything else. And it wasn't. So just like penicillin, you know, the discovery of penicillin, they look in the waste bin and something's happening when it shouldn't be. He realized that one of his supposedly failed tests must actually be pretty interesting. Sure enough, they looked back and it had high levels of chromium as well as iron and carbon. And voila, we had the discovery of what he was calling rustless steel, which was eventually renamed as stainless steel because it doesn't stain or rust as easily. So having a keen eye for detail might be important for materials discovery. Not just keen eye though, how about a keen ear for detail? This story is awesome. So uh, you've got William J. Bueller. This guy's working at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory here in the United States on a project. Now they were making nose cones for missiles, right? For the Polaris missile. Now these missiles, when they re-enter the atmosphere, they get extremely hot. And so, uh, uh, you know, because of that, they have to discover materials, new alloys that would be able to withstand these extreme conditions. So he had started work on something, and as a place to start, there was a book of binary alloys, right? So binary alloys, so mixtures of two different elements, and he's trying just a bunch of these things, right? Um, one of those is a material that's a mixture of nickel and titanium, right? So he's making a bunch of different ingots of all these different alloys, including this nickel titanium ingot. Um, and one way that he was testing them, and I'm not sure why this was standard, but one of their ways for testing materials is they would take the domes that they'd cast, these big ingots of domes, and they would drop them on the floor, right? And many of the ones that had the properties they were interested in made a really loud bell ringing sound, bong, something like that. And so that was a first guess. So as he's doing this with these ingots, he drops this nickel titanium alloy on the floor and it thuds. Instead of making this nice clear ringing bell, it sounded like a sack of flour hitting the ground, right? So he figured this was not going to be useful for his missile dome application, and he, that was just going to be a, a rejected material. But he was a little bit curious, and so he took one of these ingots before it had cooled down. It was, it was at this elevated temperature when he drops it. It did ring. So he realized that this material must be interesting. There's something happening thermodynamically at a, as a function of temperature. In one case, its structure must be slightly different because it's ringing like a bell at higher temperatures, but at low temperatures, it's hitting like a sack of flour. Um, so he decides to call this the uh, Nickel Titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory, or Nitinol, right? Nickel Titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Um, he doesn't know what it's good for at this point. He just says, hey, this is a weird alloy. Something's happening at high versus low temperatures. It's not until several years later that he's working on the fatigue properties of this alloy, right? So fatigue, they're bending it back and forth over and over, over time. And it's at a group meeting. It says here that his project was brought under review and his technician was demonstrating the fatigue properties to some senior officials. During the presentation, one of the officials present heated the nitinol with a lighter 
at which point it rapidly straightened out. And we have the discovery of shape memory alloys, materials that you heat treat them, apply a, a difference in temperature, and all of a sudden they can return to a shape which they had previously held if they were deformed under, you know, now we know a certain conditions and the transformation uh, that takes place. Again, this may have not even taken place or uh, been discovered had he not had this keen ear for detail and been listening and been curious about what was around him. You're catching a thread here. Not a lot of these things are being rationally discovered. A lot of it is scientific curiosity leading them to where it'll to where they went next. How about this one? I love this. Uh, some discoveries might be the result of totally unsafe lab practices. This is wild. So the researcher's name is uh, so Constantine Falberg. He's in the United States visiting. He's doing like a I don't know if it's a sabbatical, but he's doing a an international research stay at Johns Hopkins University in Ira Remsen's lab, the year's 1879, okay? So this Konstantin Falberg guy, he's in the lab working on coal tar derivatives. Um, he's not working on sugar, right? But he's sort of, you know, stuck in his usual work. And it says this, he lost the consciousness of time and he went on to miss his supper. And upon realizing the hour, his mind went all haphazard as he dropped all of his work and he proceeded to go have a meal. R without realizing it, he hadn't washed his hands off, right? As he exits the lab. But he's so hungry, he goes to the, um, the cafeteria, the restaurant, and he starts eating a piece of bread that he had ordered. And then he realizes when he bites into it that it is extremely sweet. He thought that it was a piece of, uh, what does it say, a piece of cake or something uh, that he had ordered. But he realized that that wasn't the case. And then when he was done with his meal, he wipes his face off with a napkin. And it is, too, also just extremely sweet. And so he's extremely, you know, confused at where this sweet flavor is coming from. Right? It says here, I was puzzled. I again raised my goblet, and as fortune would have it, it applied my mouth to where my fingers had been touching the glass before. The water seemed syrup. It flashed on me that it was the cause of the singular universal sweetness, and accordingly I tasted the end of my thumb and found that it surpassed any confectionery that I had ever eaten. Right? Uh, so he's shocked now. He realizes it's on his hands and he starts to think, oh, maybe it was something I was doing in the laboratory. And get this, it says recalling his last task of being in the laboratory, it dawned upon him that the sugary flavor emerged from some chemical composition existing in the coal tar that he'd been working on. He darted off to the lab, exploding with euphoria. Falberg began tasting every Petri dish, every beaker in an urge to excavate the miracle composition. And it was fortunate that obviously nothing was toxic or venomous uh, that he'd been working on. And eventually he stumbled upon the beaker, which contained an impure solution of saccharin, and thus set on to purifying it. And he eventually discovered the substance, which is now the basis of sweet and low, right? And many other, you know, there's been other artificial sweeteners that were discovered the exact same way, where basically scientists recklessly were tasting fingers or beakers. <laughs> Just sounds crazy. So one way that we could go about discovering new materials is through unsafe lab practices. Maybe not the most efficient way to go about it. Again, maybe why we need materials informatics to help us out. But that's one way. Now, the last example I'll give you is some materials discovery is just going to require mistakes, accidents, total and complete flukes, right? This was the case with the discovery of vulcanized rubber, right? So Charles Goodyear, right? an amazing individual. This guy was obsessed with rubber. Now, in his time, they didn't have vulcanized rubber because he discovered it. So what they did have was this natural rubber. And the natural rubber they had was not great. It got really tacky and sticky. At high temperatures, it would actually melt and decompose. It was not what they wanted it to be. But it had so much promise that he was anxious to make it better. So he's busy working on it. He's trying so many things. In fact, he moved all over the place. He was in New York, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Connecticut, constantly moving, trying to find investors and laboratories to conduct his experiments. And he would just mix things in whatever thing he had available. He was using pots and pans in makeshift laboratories. It says he set them up in his wife's kitchen. At one point, he had all these debts from his experiments and he was not having success, so he ended up in debtor's prison. But he still spent night after night working on things there, trying to pay for it back his creditors. He was in dangerous working conditions. He was in, inhaling toxic concoctions. He had nitric acid and lime and turpentine. He would mix them together right there where he was living crazy stories but there was just no stopping this guy it was pretty wild at one point i, I thought this was just tragic he, when he ran out of money to pay for his experiments he actually sold all of his family's belongings their furnishings even his kids textbooks ah it's just heartbreaking 
Um, but you know what? He kept, it said he kept some China teacups, not out of, you know, it says, not out of the sentiment, but because they could double in the evenings as mixing bowls for his rubber and turpentines, the biographer Slack writes about him. Um, so he had not found any answer. He'd just been trying everything. He'd had many contracts by people that used post office, for example, wanted him to make better, better rubber mail bags. But every time they were just melting in the hot weather and getting tacky. So after setback after setback, here we are in 1837. His family has lost everything. There'd been a big financial panic that year. But two years later in 1839, he's in a factory in Woburn, Massachusetts. Um, he has his stove there, and as the story goes, he's sort of working on his things as usual, and he accidentally spills some sulfur upon a hot stove where he'd been working. And then to his surprise, adding this little bit of sulfur changed the rubber. Instead of melting, it actually hardened when it was heated, heated so it cured. And we have the discovery of vulcanized rubber, and then he could obviously seek and try and understand what exactly had happened, why sulfur had made this big uh, change. So I, I love these different stories because it shows the crazy, random, fortuitous, serendipitous, whatever you want to call it, just complete lucky in many cases, or extremely inefficient, just driving through every possible scenario. There's got to be something better than that, right? Between going through every possible scenario, brute force, and relying on sheer luck, to get us there, there's got to be a better way to discover materials, and that is the promise of materials informatics. Because instead of actually doing every single experiment or relying on luck, we can simulate tons and tons and tons of potential high ranking candidates, and then we can go out and investigate the ones that actually look pretty good. So, I'm gonna let's dive into that and talk about how it works. But before we do that, our next video will be on the differences between traditional machine learning and materials informatics. So, stay tuned.